my name is Paul Meunier, and I'm here to tell my story of my daughter, Hannah. And I'd like to frame it in the context of how we became Hannah's Bananas. Because I never thought one day I would stand up in front of a group of people and say, like, we're some pretty cool bananas. But we are some pretty cool bananas, and I want to tell you how we got there, because it hasn't been a pleasant journey. Um, my goal today, just like Audrey and Lori, is to put a face to what the condition is that you're all working on. And I want to introduce you to my daughter, Hannah. And I hope that Hannah's face gets lodged in your memory. One of the things we do every time we meet with a school person, with a doctor, with um, somebody who's going to be watching Hannah for a camp or something like that, we make sure that we build a relationship with people. Because we need you to think about Hannah when I'm not here. When you're doing your research or you're doing your market surveys or you're filling orders or whatever it is your role here is at Upshur Smith, we want you to have Hannah in your mind when you're working. Even if you're out mowing the grass, I want you to think about Hannah. Because <laughs> believe me, I do. Um, Hannah started out as a very curious little kid. Um, we always knew she was really bright and she was extremely fascinated with reading. This kid could read and recite um, books, verbatim, long books, not just like, you know, this good night moon. I mean, regular books. She was fascinated with it. She spent most of her time doing this, sitting and staring at books. She didn't get out and run and play a lot. Her intellect was really far advanced. And we always thought, well, we have a pretty smart kid here. And we thought this is going to be something that's going to carry her through life, is going to be her intellect. Um, all in all, she's a pretty happy little kid. She had a lot of health problems growing up. She was six and a half weeks early, a little premature. And um, she developed RSV as a little kid, which is a respiratory virus that's fatal to small children. But she lived with a nebulizer mask on her face a lot of time when she was a little kid. She took a lot of nebulizers. But, you know, after a lot of antibiotics and stuff, we've kind of figured out how to deal with that. All in all, this little kid was the happiest little kid you could ever imagine. She just loved life. Loved everything, ER visits with, you know, asthma attacks, nothing like that phased her. She had fun with the doctor, she just loved life and was curious. Everything was always, we're in the ER rooms and she's picking up like pamphlets and reading them and we're just going, my goodness, it's kind of boring to me, but I know that she likes it. Um, when this is her preschool graduation, she, at that point, her preschool teacher was telling us you have a gift to child. And we always thought, well, we have a really smart child. We never thought she was gifted. But she would take books when she was like three and four years old and turn them upside down and read them backwards and upside down. And she could tell us what the book was about. And we was like, well, this is really smart. But we never thought she was gifted, you know, writing thesis papers when she was 13 or anything like that. But we thought, wow, we have a smart kid. And I just want you to see that sparkle in that eyes. We didn't see that a lot after this. She had life in her like there's no tomorrow. And we have lost that sparkle. Epilepsy has taken that away. Now her eyes are dull and flat. Um, but this is when she was graduating. This is in kindergarten. She was um, did a lot of reading to all the other classmates because they were doing um, reading these books and stuff like that. And her kindergarten teacher had her reading to all the classmates all the time. And they had this thing, if you got to sit in this chair, you were the top dog. And Hannah read to these people all the time. Matter of fact, when Hannah came home, from kindergarten, the very first day, there was a list of spelling words they're going to read that day and a, and a note to the parents about this is what your kids are going to learn, and by the end of the year, they'll be able to spell this words. Well, my daughter came home and she read the whole brochure to us and told us what it meant. <laughs> the, the spelling words were cat, hat, those kind of things. So we knew we had a bright kid. And intellect, remember this, intellect was going to carry her far. Intellect is how my daughter was going to navigate through the world. And then, May 18th, 2005 hit. This is the day our world changed forever. This is probably the day we became Hannah's Bananas. At that point, we had no idea what Hannah's Bananas was. We didn't know there was logos out there with smiley faces and stuff, but we knew, wow, something is very different. My daughter had her first seizure on this day. She woke up in the middle of the night screaming bloody murder. There was something going on neurologically in her brain, and she was inconsolable. Her brain was just on fire. And I thought she was hemorrhaging. I, I thought, my daughter's going to die. This is the night I'm going to lose my daughter. And so we rushed her to the hospital, and um, 
we got there and they did all kinds of tests. They thought um, they did spinal taps and didn't give her enough medicine. I had to hold her down while they injected her. And um, things just changed forever, drastically. I, I, my world has never been the same. Hannah's world has never been the same since May 18th, 2005. Now, when we first got diagnosed with <coughs> epilepsy, we didn't even say Hannah has epilepsy. We said Hannah has seizures. Because my wife and I are both achievers on this. And I don't mean that like egotistically, but have, has, have you done the strengths-based assessments here? Everybody's done it. Great, cool. We both really score high, both my wife on the achievement level. And so we wake up every morning and go, what are we going to solve today? You know, is it, you know we're going to do something different, but we're going to solve something. We wake up early every morning. We can't sleep because we got to get up and do something. We were on a quest. We were going to solve it. There's a bump in the road. We're going to make these seizures go away, and we're going to get back on with life. It's not going to be a big deal. And we spent about three years traveling. We went to the Cleveland Clinic. We went to the Mayo Clinic. We switched doctors. We consulted with everybody we knew. Everybody that we knew possibly was telling us about all these different treatment modalities, and we absorbed it all, and we were gonna, we were gonna solve it. We did numerous trials and medications. We, she's been on cocktails and medications. She's been on every one that you can think of, all except one that they, the doctors won't put her on, but we've exhausted that. And then we tried the ketogenic diet. If anybody knows what that is, that's where you just eat carbs, or you don't eat carbs, you just eat protein and you know. My daughter hated this. This is the only time my daughter said, I hate my life, I hate seizures, I hate epilepsy, it's all my fault because we took away her comfort and I was eating throughout this terrible time. Um, and we got to the point where we we're going to try um, resection surgery. And that's, I'm going to, some of you may know what this is, some of you may not. I'm going to be kind of graphic, but resection surgery, generally, if you have focal point seizures, if your seizures all start in exactly the same spot, you could be a good candidate for removing that part of the brain where your seizures start. We got to the point where we said resection surgery is our answer. We went out to the National Institute of Health. They did all kinds of horrible things to my daughter. They put half her brain asleep on one side, and she did a series of tests, put half her brain asleep on the other side to see what was going on. All very frightening stuff to her, but this kid was a champion. I mean, she never complained. But you can tell she was absolutely frightened. So we're we're going to solve it. Okay, we got it. Resection surgery, we're done. And we said, well, let's have a party to celebrate. You know, it's going to be a horrible thing you're going to have to go through, Hannah. You, you, brain surgery just turned my stomach to even think about what they're going to do. But we said, let's have a party, and invited her friends. And at this point, she still had friends. And we had about 10 or 15 of her friends showed up, and we had a bowling party, and it was all goodbye to seizures. It was the weekend before she checked into the hospital on Monday morning to have part of her brain taken away. Um, as it turns out, it didn't really work very well. She went through awful things. If anybody's ever, they, they call it stimulation tests or sim tests, stim tests they do. They, so I'm going to be graphic. What they did is they took a big part of her skull off, laid this grid of sensors on her head, put her skull back on, bored some holes in the top of her skull and had wires sticking out of it. And she lived in the hospital for two weeks like this because this was the final test to see if they could do it. And they, she went through these series of tests where they're stimulating the parts of the brain. And these freaked her out like there's no tomorrow. They, because they were throwing her into seizures and she's saying, stop, you know, because they were giving her seizures and they were making her hand go up and they were making her so she couldn't speak and all this stuff. And she didn't understand, quite honestly, the whole physiology of it. But it was absolutely frightening to her. And we got to the point where we could tell they kept doing the stims test, and you know, as a parent, you're kind of figuring out this isn't good. They keep doing it over and over and over again. They're not sure about it. So the doctor pulled us into the consulting room, and he said, "I have to tell you, I don't think we can do it." And we were told at this point, 95% of the kids who make it this far to the stims test, you're a good candidate for it. They don't get you that far unless they really think this is going to solve your problems. And is telling us we just can't do it. Her language is really close to her focal point of her seizures. And I can't promise you that we won't leave her speechless. And immediately he said, no, nope, you know, we can't do that. She's just too young. There's no way we can leave her speechless. We just can't take that risk. Time is on our side. So we went. The doctor said, do you want me to tell her? I said, no. You know, this is our responsibility. She's our child. I'll, I'll, we'll tell her. And 
It was the most dramatic moment of my life. Every time I get to this point, I'm in that room with her again. I'm sitting there with her telling her, man, we can't do it. We're going to have to live with seizures. And she said, I don't want to. Let's just tell the doctor. If I don't speak, that's fine. You know, I, I don't have to speak. I don't want to live with seizures. I can't live with seizures anymore. And he said, no, nope, Hannah, you can't do it. We can't. There's too many people out there trying to solve this. There's too many people like Upshur Smith that want to make your life better. And she said to me, in her infinite wisdom, after about a half hour of just sobbing and hugging, right, we're thinking, like, how am I going to get through this moment? How are we going to carry on? This all happened so quickly. And then she looked at me and she said, but it's not like it's the end of the world, is it, Dad? And I said, you know, Hannah, it was a wife away my tears. I said, no, you know, it's really not. And she said, can I still ride horses? And I said, oh, God, Hannah, yes, you can still ride your horses. And she said, can, can I go fishing? I said, oh, God, yes, Hannah, we, we'll go fishing as much as you want. We'll buy a 14-foot fishing boat that I'll sleep in someday. <laughs> and we'll, we'll fish as much as we can. And after that, she framed it for us. She had more wisdom than I did or my wife did and has given us more strength than, than I'll ever know. That I, I, I don't have as much strength as her. She, this little kid, kid is my shining star. This is my champion of life. Some people like, you know, these sports heroes or something. I tell you what, my champion, you're looking at it right there. That night, we sat and watched the Twins games and had popcorn. She just was a wonderful champ. So the second time I cried, <laughs> besides now, of course, there's been a few more after that because I just kind of cheered up now. The day after, we were just went through this moment with my daughter, Hannah. This is her third grade class. And I don't know if you, if you can't read it. It says, Hannah, you're near, you're our star. That's her class. These were her friends. She, these were, some of these kids were at the parties. That's the principal. That's her teacher, uh, Miss Kuba. When this came across and I opened this, I thought, oh my God, people care. People care about me, they care about Hannah, and somehow we're going to make it. This wasn't sad crying. This was, I was touched like I've never been touched in my life before. This was the moment in my life where I said, humanity is okay. So we, it is what it is. That's our phrase we say now. Everything we do is, boy, we, some things we control, some things we can't. But it is what it is, and we just make the best of life the best that we can. We take calculated risks. We have this horse. This is Hannah's horse called JR. JR stands for Just Right. He's a dead broke horse that we've trained just when if Hannah's riding and she rides competitively, but if she's having a seizure and quits giving commands, this horse knows to stop and walk to the middle of the arena. And he's done it before. Hannah's fallen off of this horse a couple times in seizures. And the horse, it's the most touching thing. I've never seen it, but my wife tells me she's seen it. When she falls off and has a seizure and is on the ground seizing, that horse takes his little nuzzle and pushes up against her like, get up, you're okay, get up. And she, that horse knows. She has a connection with that horse like nobody else because you see, Hannah doesn't have friends anymore. When she was having seizures, before seizures, she was doing all the birthday parties, all the neighborhood kids were coming around playing, were having fun, but slowly then went away. Hannah had a, had a seizure at the table when they were opening presents at a birthday party at one of her kids. And since then, she doesn't get invited to stuff. Um, and we're not mad about that. It's the reality. I mean, they're, they're thinking, well, it's kind of calculated risk to bring this kid in and you know, kind of spoil the birthday party, let me tell you. Um, but we take everything we do is calculated risk. And the other the reason that Hannah doesn't have any friends anymore is what Audrey was talking about, is the cognitive side effects of medicines. Hannah's on four different medicines right now, and one of them is diazepam for the, the non-chemist people. Diazepam is Valium. My daughter's walking around drunk as a skunk every day. She has such a hard time articulating. She can't pace with other kids in her classroom. She can't keep up with girls that are 14. My goodness, there's the, <laughs> Hannah's still figuring out what they said the first thing, and they're on the fourth different topic. She grows, she's, she's People are friendly to her. We've had the Epilepsy Foundation in. They, they educate the kids about what epilepsy is like. Kids are really nice to her. We're, we're really lucky. She hasn't been teased. And I know that that's not true for everybody. But she hasn't been teased. And kids like her and watch out for her. But she doesn't have friends. She just doesn't. And I can tell you as a parent, as a kid who grew up as kind of a social person, 
I was with friends and sleepovers and riding my bike and playing bit all the time. And I envisioned this is what my kid was going to do. And as a parent, I can tell you, sometimes it's hard to not be a little angry about that. Because this isn't how it was supposed to be. This isn't what we signed up for. But I tell you what, we got the perfect kid for it. She's the superstar. So I just like this picture. Um, I, I'm, I was the guide, so we do a lot of fishing, and that's, that's my little boat, um, on our cabin, and we spend a lot of time at our cabin. She loves it up there. You know, but, but in that is these horrible moments where you have, you know, like normally sleeping looks really peaceful. I don't know if you can see her eyes. They're all swollen and stuff. She, there's nothing peaceful about this picture. She just had a pretty big seizure there and helped her climb into bed. We just got, she just got out of school one day, was excited to go to the barn and ride her horse. Two minutes into the, the um, truck, she had a big seizure. This is, what, this is what she looked like when we arrived at the barn. She didn't ride that day. She was just too out of it when she woke up. These seizures affect your life on a big, big way. Um, my daughter has, in, in the midst of all this, she also has, well, she has epilepsy. She has type 1 diabetes, and she developed that a couple of years after epilepsy. And she has immune deficiency. That's why she was so sick when she was a little kid, and why she lived with nebulizers and antibiotics. But I can tell you, we've got the immune deficiency figured out. She, twice a week, she injects um, antibodies in sub-Q into her system, and she's healthier than I am. We've got that figured out. Type 1 diabetes, if anybody, and I, I hope I don't offend anybody in here. Believe me, that's not my goal. Diabetes is easy. It's a science. We can track. We can measure her blood sugar levels. We can calculate insulin rates. We have to mess with it all the time. But it's a science. We can figure it out. When things go high, we know what to do. When things go low, we know what to do. We know how to make adjustments. She's got pods. She doesn't have to inject herself all the time. She has to check her blood sugar, you know, but that's not a big deal. She doesn't care. It's epilepsy that has absolutely turned our world upside down. Epilepsy turned us into hands and bananas. So one of the things we do when being the achiever, I have to do something to stay focused. I have to do something that gives me incentive to keep going. And so we became hands and bananas and we do the stroll for epilepsy. That's our big thing. We have a lot of people walk with us. We've raised a lot of money for the Epilepsy Foundation because we think they do wonderful things. And, we're so fortunate to have met Vicki. I have to tell you, when, when Hannah first had seizures, not epilepsy, when we were going to solve it, we had social workers in the hospital come up saying, did you hear about the Epilepsy Foundation? Yeah, cool. We, we don't need that. We got, Hannah's got seizures. We're going to solve it. Why do we need the Epilepsy Foundation? All of a sudden now, Epilepsy Foundation is a big part of our world. Um, we do whatever we can during media. Here I am in my little boat at Forest Lake. Uh, you know, we can't get... We can't get people to cover up epilepsy. There's, I, I spent three days in this boat on Forest Lake, and we had some local media coverage. The Star Tribune did a story, but the whole idea was to get on TV, right? I wanted to tell the story. I wanted people to see it in a mass kind of media sort of way. I spent three days in this wonderful, I, I could tell you so many anecdotal stories about people came up in the boat and go, what are you doing in that big balloon? Who are you? And, and you know, this wonderful stories about people that touched by epilepsy, and they, they would give me money. They just came up and gave me money. Empty their pockets, they'd swim trunks on, but I five bucks here. And so, but anyways, that wasn't the point. The point was to be able to tell the story and earn media. That night, when I got I got off the lake after three days, the, the lead one of the big stories on the news that night was a, 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 a lawnmower demolition derby in Princeton for five minutes. And I just spent three days trying to tell people about how awful this condition is to live with epilepsy and how we need to raise this awareness. So. One of the things we do is we tell people all the time, and we tell Hannah this all the time. This is how we stay our focus. There's smart people like you in the room here today working on epilepsy research, and that's what gives us hope. We know that there's a big challenge out there for you guys to find a cure. And when you're working, I don't care what your job is here. When you're working, please think about Hannah and Audrey's son and Lori, because these are the faces, these are the lives that you're working on. You're not making widgets here, folks. You're, what you're doing is going to affect me and my daughter, hopefully. So this is our Hannah's Bananas team. It keeps growing. Last year, we had 124 people on our team did the stroll for epilepsy. We had 18 dogs. So we try to get dogs, too. And we give everybody a t-shirt that says Hannah's Bananas and the dogs. I don't know if you can see it. the dogs have. 
They have little bandanas that say Hannah's bananas. So we try to bring guys with too. It's kind of fun. So um, this year, Hannah was chosen the winning kid at the Epilepsy Foundation. We did wonderful things. We went out to Washington, D.C. And, and advocating to legislators about the importance of awareness. We, she got to run on the field with the Gophers, Coach Kill. Um, she got to throw up the first pitch at Target Center just a couple weeks ago. This, I tell you what, she got, she was so nervous, she said, Dad, I almost peed my pants on Sunday. <laughs> but she had a blast, a lifetime memory. We're so grateful that the Epilepsy Foundation has given us. If you want to follow more about Hannah Banana, I'd be remorse if I didn't tell you. We have a website and we have Facebook. If you, do, if you go to your Facebook page and you search in, right, uh, for those of you, uh, two seven, put in there, you type in Hannah's Bananas and you please like us. We, we give updates, we have stories about what she's done, some of the trials and tribulations. We'd love for you to follow Hannah on Facebook because it's an important part to us. This is what we do. This, today's therapy for me. I'm a psychologist by trade, which might frighten some of you, but <laughs> <laughs> today's therapy for me. I'm awfully glad. So there's Hannah. Please remember her when you're out mowing the lawn, washing the car, when you're taking a lunch break. That's the kid that's counting on you guys. Mark, she's counting on you to find an answer for her life because she wants nothing more to have a normal life. That's all she wants. And that sparkle in her eyes is gone. She's flat and dull inside that medicine. We have to figure out how to get past that.